My name is Connie Clark. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee today, April 9th, 2010, to interview Judge Martha Craig Daughtry. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation and in conjunction with the Tennessee Supreme Court Historical Society. Tell us your full name and your date and place of birth. Well, I was born Martha Craig Kirko, um, and the name that I use now is Martha Craig Daughtry, which is my married name. Um, and I was born in Covington, Kentucky in July, uh, July 21st, 1942. You also have a very familiar nickname. Yes. When and how did you get it? <laughs> my, what is it? My brother started calling me Sissy when I was, uh, when he was about two, three years old. It stuck, um, and I uh, fancied it up a little uh, after I got to be a teenager, uh, spelling it with a C-I-S-S-Y instead of an S, but uh, I respond to both, both versions. I want to know a little bit about your family, but let's start with your grandparents. Tell me a little about them. Yes, my mother's parents uh, were from uh, Franklin, Tennessee, just down the road a bit. Um, he was, he owned the lumber company in uh, Franklin and did a lot of uh, house construction uh, right up until the uh, Depression when the whole thing, of course, went under. My grandmother, and he, he died, uh, uh, they said, of a broken heart in about 1936 before I was born. My grandmother, he had given my grandmother a four-unit apartment house for her birthday one year. So she, while left penniless when he died, had, had uh, some place to live and a, and a source of uh, a, a very uh, sort of uh, not very great source of income, but uh, for the rest of her life. Um, my other grandparents uh, were, uh, he was a doctor, um, she was a homemaker. They lived in northern Kentucky in a um, suburb of Covington, which is basically across the river from Cincinnati. Uh, mother, I, I know that I probably uh, knew at one time how mother met my father, um, but I, it's lost, unfortunately. Uh, and she married him uh, in uh, 1941. Uh, they went on a honeymoon to Mexico and uh, stayed about three weeks, and nine and a half months later I was born. So I claim, um, I claim to have been uh, a Mexican baby in conception, uh, at least. Um, I think that's how it was in those days. You got married and and had a family almost immediately. Um, Tell me about your dad, his, well, his name and what happened he, to him. He, his name was Spence Emil Kirko. Um, his, uh, his, his story is, is tragic. He had had rheumatic fever as a child and uh, he was uh, in a dentist chair uh, to get some wisdom teeth extracted at a time when his father, the doctor, was out of town. I'm, I'm quite sure if my grandfather had been there and had been able to give some advice, uh, it would have been, if you're gonna extract those teeth, you need to pack it with sulfur um, so that there's no uh, infection with this weakened uh, rheumatic heart. In fact, the dentist didn't pack it with sulfur and blood poisoning set in and my father was dead about three days um, later. They had, uh, they had invented um, penicillin at the time, but all of it was being used in the war effort for the, for the soldiers in Europe and uh, in the Pacific. Uh, about six months to a year after he died, it became uh, available uh, to civilians. It would have saved his life, of course, but um, so that was, she became a widow at like age 26 and brought me back to Franklin, uh, Tennessee. It was on a trip back up to Fort Mitchell to visit my father's parents, my grandparents, uh, when she met my stepfather, who was from South Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, and married him. And so uh, I had two sets of, of grandparents in basically the same, same area, my father's parents and my stepfather's parents. How old were you when your father died, and, and how old were you uh, when your mother remarried? I was just barely, barely a year old 
when my father died, and I was uh, five years old when she remarried, or she remarried, they remarried, she remarried on Flag Day, June the 14th of uh, 1947, and I turned five the next month. And you had a, a brother, I think, after that. Yeah, about a year later, um, I, I did. My brother was born, my half-brother. Uh, Jake uh, was the um, son that my stepfather had always wanted. Uh, that turned out to be a sad story, too, because uh, while my younger brother is a very loving uh, and wonderful person, he is, in fact, uh, what they now call developmentally disabled. He was uh, born retarded, uh, possibly because uh, the uh, nursing staff at the little hospital in Ohio where we were living held him back uh, while the gynecologist, the OBGYN, showed up uh, from a party or something. I mean, it was back in the days where nobody brought a lawsuit <laughs> against a a doctor in the, who was a member of the community. So w they never knew exactly, but it, it, looks, it looked a lot like lack of oxygen during the birth that, that caused the brain damage. And how did your family deal with his challenges as you were growing oh, up? Oh, it was a challenge. Uh, those, it's hard to believe, but in those days, um, there was no, um, even in a fairly good school system, um, there was no place for children who were retarded or disabled in some way, but especially, I think, for the, for the retarded children. There were no special ed teachers. Uh, they just simply had no way of dealing with them, and those children stayed home and were largely uneducated. Uh, Mother Daddy didn't think that was obviously the way to go, so there was a lot of effort to get him into schools. I, I remember Mother uh, driving out to uh, the main Cincinnati Dayton Highway every day with him to put him on a special bus that took him to a school that was somewhere north uh, of where we were living at a great expense to them. So a lot of the, uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, extra money back in those days, but anything they got that went to trying to get Jake um, helped in some way or another and educated. Where did you attend school? Well, I started there in Middletown, Ohio, in the, in the uh, school system there, Old South School, which unfortunately later burned down, beautiful old brick building that uh, in those days, you know, you had grade school, one through six, and uh, junior high, and uh, after uh, getting through the, the uh, elementary school and junior high there, um, I went off to school uh, to the National Cathedral School in Washington in uh, D.C. in 1958. And There's a great story about your, your going. Tell us about how you got there and what the experience was like. Well, they put me on the train in Cincinnati, and uh, uh, I was used to taking trains by myself. I'd been many times on the old hummingbird between Cincinnati and Nashville coming down to spend the summers with my grandmother. And uh, my father would always find the porter on the, on the car where I was and, you know, pass him a $5 bill or something, keep an eye on this child. And it had worked every time. So this time they put me on the, I guess, the C&O or the B&O train to Washington and, uh, uh, by myself with, uh, with the luggage. And I got off the train and, uh, w you know, walked out to, to uh, try to find a way to get to school. Um, eventually took a cab and you know you walk through the doors of the Union Station there in Washington and there's the Capitol you know right there and smack in front of me and it was uh, I, I've never gotten over the feeling that I had when I saw that for the first time it just really it was a grabber and I How loved my you? years and I was um, 16 made a deep impression during your youth, you spent summers with your grandmother, did yes. you not? Tell us about some of your experiences in Franklin. Well, um, there were two places in Franklin. Well, no, three. The, I, I say three. The, the uh, first air-conditioned building that I'd ever been in in my life was the Franklin Theater, and it was not air-conditioned at that time. It was air-cooled, and uh, it was showing uh, double features uh, almost every night all week long, and, and the and what was being shown 
changed uh, every two days in the middle of the week and then three days over the weekend. So you could, if it was really hot, you could spend, you know, three out of the seven nights in the air-cooled Franklin Theater watching all kinds of sort of B-level uh, movies. Uh, and uh, of course the whole thing was segregated. Uh, I didn't quite understand why, but uh, no, I was not allowed to sit up there in that little balcony uh, upstairs. So we saw, when I, when I would be there in the summer, lots of movies. Um, the other place I loved was the old Franklin Library that was in an antebellum house a couple of blocks from where my grandmother lived. And so, you know, one summer I read every Agatha Christie that there was in that library. Um, it was that sort of a, that, and although the library wasn't air conditioned, those, those eight or 12 inch walls kept it pretty cool. So it was a nice place to be in the summer. And then finally there was Willow Plunge, the, the uh, privately owned um, uh, swimming pool and uh, I can't remember what all, miniature golf and uh, that nearly everybody in Franklin, uh, although it, it was indeed also segregated, but all the children in Franklin sort of spent the summer out at, at, um, at Willow Plunge. And there were two summers when my grandmother worked out there. She was the, it was the only job she'd ever had in her life. There was something in the family that thought it was not ladylike to work outside the home, and so nobody did. But these two summers, my grandmother for three months was the greeter, the official greeter, uh, near the, near the uh, place where you changed clothes. You got a locker and changed clothes. And uh, the, the sad story about that is that she got six, exactly six months worth of work, which was just uh, short of qualifying her for Social Security. <laughs> if she'd worked six months in a week, she would have been, would have gotten Social Security in her old age, but she, she missed that. Anyway, I had lovely summers uh, out there, and I was allowed to play miniature golf at no cost, so I got pretty good at that, too. It was wonderful. Returning first to your elementary years, are there particular teachers that you remember that made a difference? Well, the interesting thing about the teachers, uh, the, the uh, law in Ohio until 1948 uh, was uh, prevented uh, married women from teaching. If you, if you were a teacher in the Ohio school system and marriage, you had to, and you were a woman, you had to quit your job. So when they talk about old maid school teachers, it was, uh, it was de rigor. Um, and so it, it, I started in that school system in actually 47 in kindergarten. And there was cheating around the uh, edges at that point. So there were one or two uh, married women that were teaching, but uh, most of them, in fact, were, um, were unmarried. And I guess the most famous was Miss Hawks, who not only taught third grade, and, and, but also ran the summer program at the nearby park. So she was in charge of uh, the park program and all the little kids in the neighborhood spent the day at the park. I mean, you just opened the back door, people, you know, the kids went out and walked two blocks to the park. And when you compare that to uh, today, it's, um, it's a huge, huge change in how we raise children and, and, and how we let them get around. No play dates back then. <laughs> <laughs> you developed a medical condition while you were uh, in fifth or sixth grade, mm -hmm. I think. Tell us about that. Well, it was, it, uh, I had a growth spurt and scoliosis uh, set in. Um, th th my mother took me to orthopedic specialists in Cincinnati. They said, well, you can put her in a uh, cast for six months. It would probably straighten this out. Uh, but she'd have to be in effect, homeschooled, which there really was no provision for at that time. Or you can put her in a brace for a couple of years. And uh, so mother thought it sounded more humane to put me in the brace. The problem was she was leaving every morning to drive my brother up to meet that bus. And so once she left, I would take the brace off and hide it under the bed. And, uh, <laughs> and so I don't know how much of that two years I spent in the brace, but let's just put it this way not enough. And I hit that age when I had just gotten my first pair of glasses. 
uh, was about to get braces on my teeth, had a full-blown case of acne, and we're talking about seventh and eighth grade now, and this, uh, this back brace on that, that went over my shoulders and around and made me look like, I don't know, Attila the Hun or something uh, in school. You talk about what we used to refer to as an inferiority complex. Uh, I had one, and it didn't help that I was making straight A's in school. That, that gets you uh, 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 sort of stigmatized, too. So it was a little rough. Um, but the grown-ups kept telling me there was life after junior high. So, <laughs> and fortunately, as it turned out, there was. <laughs> what are your favorite memories about the National Cathedral School? Oh gosh, that was, th that may have been my favorite two years of my entire life. Um, first of all, it was being in Washington. Uh, being there by the cathedral was fabulous because it was only about, oh maybe, uh, but somewhere between a half and two thirds finished. And the construction had sort of uh, died down. They needed to have another big fundraising to, to uh, get it finished. But just being there and seeing how a Gothic cathedral was put together and all was, was fabulous. Um, I, I have to say, I remember on Sundays when, when the boarding department was required to go to church, the two people I sat with my first year every Sunday in church. Uh, I had been raised as an Episcopalian, and of course it was an Episcopal church, cathedral. But the, the person on my right was normally my roommate who was, from, uh, who was a Buddhist from Thailand. And on the left was uh, Ellen May, who was Jewish. Uh, and uh, Ellen turned out to be the person who founded and runs the, uh, the Foundation for Family and Work in New York. And, appears on the Today Show every once in a while. So it was sort of a, a, a secular religious experience uh, for me, actually. How did your family choose National Cathedral? Mother, had, mother knew I needed to get out. Um, and, and indeed, the stresses in the family were, were considerable. And the, it looked like school was a little too easy. Um, and so, um, and you know, teenage years, I, we just, I, they were so focused on helping my brother and it made me feel like nobody cared about me. And the A's had come so easily that the other children were getting like $5 for every A they made and I was getting like, okay, where do I sign this report card? Uh, it just, it was one of those things where I wanted to go and I think they felt comfortable letting me go. And uh, she had discovered the school through, through church, through the rector of our Episcopal church. And it worked out beautifully. I, I must say, I, I, I hit my rebellion years there. Um, while I was good about going to church the first year, the second year there was a group of us that in fact are still close friends and I hope to see next month at our 50th reunion. Uh, we, were, we were bad. I mean, we used to go in one side of the cathedral, walk through, go out the other side, and straight into the bishop's garden where there were these wonderful boxwoods that were hollow inside because they were so old. And so we would sit inside the boxwoods if the weather was nice and <gasps> smoke cigarettes. Um, and... Um, and I'm sure there are some place up in the top of the cathedral, uh, the clear story up in there. I mean, there are hiding places in Gothic cathedrals like you would not believe. And we used to meet the boys from St. Albans uh, up there. And I'm sure that to this day, there's a little pile of filter cigarettes that, that we uh, left behind us um, when we graduated. Um, I have to ask you to tell us a little bit about the, the friends that you still maintain contact with. Uh, yes. Uh, well, there were a group of us, um, and what, we lost one to, to cancer uh, about three or four years ago. Uh, but uh, we're now in contact, I'm now in contact with, with Patsy, who turned out to have a PhD in English and taught college in uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Um, and Matilda, who was my roommate the second year, who got into, uh, got a PhD in communications and got into technology, and she and her husband ran a, a, a company that they were then able to sell, and they are now leading a nice life in a, 
on a little ranchette, ranchette in California. Uh, both of them write books and, and are quite, uh, they pride themselves on being pretty geeky. Um, and then there were one or two other friends that I've stayed in contact too, but those are the principal ones. Moving on now, where did you choose to go to college and how did you choose that place? Well, uh, it, it was interesting. I, I apparently was the thorn in the side of the headmistress at, at Cathedral. And so although I was on a full scholarship, what amounted to a full scholarship there, uh, the, the two schools that I applied to and were accepted to were um, uh, Vanderbilt and um, Sarah Lawrence. And uh, unfortunately, while they both admitted me, neither one of them were willing to give me a scholarship. And I found out later it was because there was a place on the recommendation from the school that said, would you award a scholarship to this person? And she had marked no. It was sort of her final. Um, uh, Miss Lee is not remembered fondly by too many uh, people who went to, to uh, cathedral school. In any event, it looked like we could deal with Vanderbilt a lot easier than sending me to Bronxville, New York. Um, I was interested in the theater. I thought being at Sarah and Lawrence would be wonderful because I could get into New York and, and follow that whole thing. And of course, it turned out to be a daydream because the school was enormously uh, expensive. Vanderbilt was too, but um, um, I managed to uh, do well enough my freshman year that um, that I got a full scholarship uh, for the rest of my, my time at Vanderbilt. So uh, mother and daddy scraped around to get that first year uh, paid for. And uh, I worked in the summers. Uh, I do remember uh, working as an au pair for some friends of ours in northern Michigan one summer in order to get money to eat on the following year. And I think it worked out to 44 cents a day was the budget that I was on. And Fortunately, at Rand Hall, which I think is still the, the um, cafeteria for the students, 44 cents went fairly far in those days. It didn't, um, you know, if you augmented it with a little peanut butter and crackers, you were, you were in pretty good shape. And so when everybody else went to Ireland to eat steak and biscuits, um, I went along too, and if they didn't eat all their french fries, I, I got a few. But it, it worked out all right. Where did you live? While I was oh. at Vanderbilt? Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the McTeer Hall uh, my freshman year, in Tolman Hall my second year. Uh, my third year, I managed to become a resident uh, advisor and help them move into Branscombe Quadrangle. I mean, we literally, uh, Dot Menick, I remember, help, was helping us, and we moved mattresses in on the beds before the freshmen got there that year. Uh, that was brand new, the quadrangle. Um, and then uh, my fourth year, I was actually married and uh, uh, was a senior in absentia and already starting law school. And I'm going to ask you about that in a few minutes, but uh, sticking with uh, undergraduate school for a few minutes, uh, tell us about the activities and, and honors uh, that you got there. Well, I, I didn't pledge a a sorority the, the, when I got there immediately, although I did try to. Um, I just kind of fell through. And, but I got picked up by the Pi Fi's after I got a straight A average the first semester and got elected to the Student Senate. There was a sort of an attraction there. Um, so I still have dear friends from the, from the sorority days. Uh, I eventually got defrocked from, uh, as a Pi Fi. That's another story. But in, Would you like to tell me Well, that? yeah, in, in just a minute. But, but anyway, that was, uh, the, the sorority stuff was wonderful. Uh, it was very innocent back in those days. Uh, I did, I was in the student senate for a couple of years and became the first woman president pro tem of the Vanderbilt student senate. Was that your first first? Uh, probably, yeah, I guess so. I hadn't thought about that. Um, and then uh, I, I wrote for the, um, the uh, literary magazine and, um, and did get into some of the honorary uh, groups, the names of which I think I've probably already <laughs> forgotten. Um, and the, the whole question about going to law school, is this a good time yes. to get into that? Mm -hmm. I was a history major and uh, 
the, uh, what happened was I was majoring in English history, which I had studied back at Cathedral and just fallen in love with. And the, the uh, history department, of course, had no women uh, professors in it, like most of the rest of um, the university. And uh, so the man under whom I was doing an honors program, six hours each semester my um, junior year, and then it was supposed to be 12 hours each semester my uh, last year, he up and uh, took a um, sabbatical and was going to turn me over to the Italian Renaissance man, a very nice uh, professor named Dayton Phillips, whom I liked a lot, but I was not, I thought studying English history under a, an Italian Renaissance guy maybe was not the optimum thing to do. In, in any event, about this same time, I was in a class called historiography, which is basically uh, sort of the philosophy of history and how history, how historians uh, operate. And uh, we had term papers uh, due, and we picked the uh, term paper uh, topics out of a shoebox, as I recall. And so I reached in and pulled out a little slip of paper that said, what is the origin of the doctrine separate but equal? And therein lies a tale, because it sent me to the law library instead of to the general university library. Uh, the law library was in the brand new law school. Uh, it had just been uh, opened. This was the, uh, I guess, the spring of 63, and um, moved from Kirkland Hall into this new building. And uh, so I go down to the library and, and uh, get oriented by the librarian and look around, and all I see are men uh, everywhere. And uh, and not only was that interesting, but um, the, the process of doing the research I thought was interesting. You start, I started with uh, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, and worked backwards from there, which is the opposite of what you normally do when you're studying history. You normally start with year one and go forward, and this was the reverse, and I just thought it was uh, a, a challenge and, and sort of unique to anything I'd studied, and so there came the point at which to decide whether to spend a year with the Italian Renaissance man or maybe do something else, and I went down to the law school. It was, I think, the last year that the uh, senior and absentia program was available uh, under the ABA accreditation, although it, I, I'm not sure of that, but in any event, uh, Describe what that Well, meant. that just meant that you, you had to have four years of undergraduate school to go to an accredited uh, law school, ABA accredited law school. Um, this, however, would have permitted me to take the last year of my undergraduate studies in the law school. Um, and uh, it, there was a question about it because I was at first in the class at that point, and, and so it meant giving up the possibility of a Founders Medal. Uh, because all the grades from the law school would go into my transcript as D's. Uh, in other words, <laughs> you got points, but uh, I, however you figured it, it they, they went over as, as uh, zero. And you, you had also made Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, yeah, I I'd already made there. Phi Beta Kappa. So I go down to the law school to see about it, and down there is one John Beasley, an old family friend from... Uh, Franklin, who, uh, who because he knew me and had known my family and his wife, although much younger, was a very uh, special friend of my grandmother's. They sang in the choir together at the, at the Episcopal Church in Franklin. I didn't know it at the time, but there was a quota at the law school. Three women a class was the maximum. And I, you know, if I'd wandered in off the street and had known John Beasley, I might not have gotten admitted simply because there were three or four other women who had applied and weren't and had finished their undergraduate and weren't trying to get this sort of special deal of coming in a year and What early. size were the classes then? Uh, they were a hun about 130. So I ended up getting admitted and starting matriculated at the law school in the fall of 1963, which is a million and a half years ago. Um, and there were 130 and three of us, and I was the only one in my section, which meant it was me and approximately 64 men. Uh, so there were, as you might guess, a lot of stories that evolved um, out of that. 
in the old days, uh, there were eight o'clock classes in the law school, and if you were in section A, you had six eight o'clocks a week. Uh, all of that, of course, is very different uh, now, too. So I had the delight of having six eight o'clocks when I was the only woman in the class uh, in the section for most of those big, big classes. We want to hear some of the stories, but let me ask you first, are there professors who were favorites and, and any who were not? Oh, there were nots, <laughs> uh, but, the, but the, the folks that I remember, uh, well, I guess I had one principal mentor there, and his name was Carl Warden. He, was, um, he, he later left Vanderbilt and went to become the dean at the university uh, law school, um, University of North Dakota Law School, and then became dean down at Mercer in uh, Macon, uh, Georgia, and died just a year or two ago. Uh, he was um, he was marvelously eccentric, and just the kind of fellow that would take on uh, a, a woman student and uh, and and not only befriend her, but in those days we didn't use the term mentor, but that's exactly what he turned out to be uh, was a mentor. He was he was clearly my favorite, and then you know there were problems with the others, um, the the. Um, there's some stories. <laughs> uh, you why don't you choose a story or two that you'd like to tell us about your experiences? Because uh, they weren't always good experiences. No, they weren't. Uh, I, I, I guess the funniest one was the first day I showed up in a maternity uh, jumper uh, the next semester, the spring of my first year. And of course, the reason they weren't uh, letting women in is because uh, among other things, you know, they get married or they get pregnant and then they drop out and and all they've done is kept some nice young man from going to law school. So when I showed up in that maternity dress and my advisor, who later became a good friend of mine uh, under very different circumstances, I don't think he spoke to me again the, the rest of the, the semester. Uh, but the funny story was in constitutional law some people have suggested that this was uh, just a coincidence, but it's, it's sort of hard to believe. I was asked uh, to stand up and recite the case of Poe versus Ullman. Poe versus Ullman was within, a, I think about a year later, the uh, reversed by the Supreme Court in a very famous case called Griswold versus Connecticut. And what Griswold versus Connecticut did was strike down the Connecticut statute that uh, prevented the sale of birth control in the state of Connecticut, even to people who were married to each other. You just simply couldn't get any birth control in Connecticut. Poe versus Ullman was the earlier case um, that, that in fact upheld that statute. So there I am standing uh, in my little uh, sage green, corduroy jumper, which I wore every day with something new uh, underneath it, a new, a fresh turtleneck or a fresh blouse of some kind. Um, and uh, talking about uh, the fact that birth control uh, could be denied as a constitutional matter uh, under, the, under the case of Poe versus Ullman. There were a lot of snickers um, around the room, as you, as you might imagine. Were there, did you develop good friends among your classmates? Yes, I did. Um, it, it was, the interesting fact is that, that the men all knew who I was, I mean, just naturally, uh, and, and I didn't know all of them. By that time, you know, by the time I got to law school, I was married um, and, uh, and no longer interested so much in the fact that everybody in the library was male. Uh, and I had married that. Uh, that year, and uh, but I did get, I did uh, develop some good friends. Um, Bob Brandt, for instance, who ended up on the on the uh, a bench here in town, and uh, several others of the of the group there. Uh, uh, Frank Woods, who was had been Larry's best man when we married, was in the law school. So there were a group. Now the what what sort of changed the. Um, class for me was the fact that uh, I did in, uh, drop out, uh, <laughs> I'm 
sure they all said, yeah, see, we told you so. When you get married, get pregnant, drop out. We'll never see her again. Uh, I was out for two years with Carrie uh, when Carrie was born, and I, she was born in the summer of 64. There wasn't any such thing in town as daycare. It may have existed in other places in this country, but not in Nashville at the time. So you had to rely on family or if you could find some woman who was taking in children in the neighborhood. Um, we couldn't even afford that. Uh, and so I stayed home with Carrie for uh, a couple of years before I went back to law school. I enjoyed the first year thoroughly. I liked little babies and I liked being with her. I didn't much enjoy the second year, the sort of getting to the toddler stage uh, eluded me. I, the, the, the joy of that I know lots of people share, but, but it just eluded me. And so I was ready to go back to law school um, after a couple of years. And they were willing to take me back on scholarship. Um, now the scholarship question, you want to hear about that? Absolutely. Uh, the, in addition to the, qu the quota of three, which we didn't know about at the time, the scholarships were discounted for the women students. So that the first thing that happened was to, you had to demonstrate need back in those days. This was not a loan, it was an outright um, uh, scholarship. You had to demonstrate need and then how much you got, how much of your tuition would be forgiven depended on your grade average. If you were a man, you could get a 100% tuition scholarship. If you were a woman, the most you could possibly get was 75%. So we had a 25% discount. And if, if you know, we had asked why that existed, they would have said, you know, because you're a girl. And we would have looked down and said, yeah, you're right, I, I am a girl. Uh, five years later, we would have said, you know, we're taking you to court over this. but. At the time, it just it, the the women's movement hadn't hit, and uh, we were just sort of it was the way it had always been done, and so um, there wasn't much we thought we could do. There were clearly slights and outright discrimination oh, yeah, that went no on throughout your it. career. How did you deal with those at that well, time? Well, uh, the, the old velvet uh, glove over the steel fist, I guess, is. Uh, I mean, you, you, there was a lot of sweet Southern girl stuff going on uh, back then. Uh, the, the famous story is the one about Rose Palermo, who was also on a 75% uh, scholarship. She's a lawyer here in town and was in my graduating class. And Rose had just uh, strung it out as far as she could go, and it was the end of her last semester. She wanted to graduate, but she couldn't come up with the last 25% of tuition, it remained unpaid for the year. And they were th the registrar had told her she couldn't graduate. And she just refused to contact her parents to say, I've got to have, oh, I don't know. You know, it's, the amount of money involved now sounds so paltry. The, when I started law school, it, the tuition was $800 a year. By the time I finished, it was 1500 a year. So a, a quarter of that was less than $400. But if you didn't have it, you didn't have it. Rose went up to John Beasley's office. Uh, he was the associate dean for admissions and everything else. And she said, uh, Dean Beasley, if you don't tell the registrar to let me graduate uh, without paying that money, I'm gonna throw myself down on your floor and I'm gonna cry and I'm gonna kick and scream until you do. And, and John's reaction was sort of typical of Southern men at the time. He said, oh my God, don't do that. Don't cry, do anything, but don't cry. And he ran over to the phone, called the registrar and said, you know, let this woman graduate. She came back down to the women's lounge. It was a little area about the size of this table uh, outside the only uh, uh, John toilet that, w that the women had and reported this to me and said, if you go upstairs and threaten to cry, he'll, he'll, he'll forgive your 25% too. And I said two things to her. One is I'm much too proud to do that, but I said also I've already paid it, so it's too late to go up. and. And cry and threaten him, uh, but that was that was the kind of corner we got into occasionally. In about one week from the date of this interview, you're going to be honored by Vanderbilt Law School uh, with a Distinguished Alumni Award. 
Do you find any irony in that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I do. And I'm, uh, I'm sort of fighting with myself. Uh, I've been told I have like two to three minutes to say something. Two to three minutes is like, mo as much as you can say is thank you very much, introduce your family and sit down. And uh, that may be uh, all I do. But I am, of course, tempted to say a few things uh, about the irony of the, of the whole thing. Are there one or two things of value that you got out of the law school that you still take with you? Oh my gosh. Um, well, yeah, the, the whole, uh, business of uh, making you think like a lawyer. I mean, I don't know how you, you uh, can deny that that happens. And it, it of course, is um, something you carry with you for the rest of your life. I think the interesting thing is that I went to law school thinking that I wanted to practice in a private firm. And I simply could not get a job. I couldn't even get an interview with the, with the law firms in Nashville. And um, uh, I even interviewed, so, you know, one of my professors said, well, the trust departments in the banks, um, they, they try that, they'll hire you. And uh, none of the banks in Nashville had a woman officer, and no, they were, were not interested. I mean, I, I talked to two or three of them, and, and uh, actually Ken Roberts, who was a law trained but was with Commerce Union Bank at the time, uh, offered to hire me to run the stock transfer division. Uh, they were transferring Mini Pearl stock certificates at the time, and it was so long ago that you actually had stock certificates, and when you traded them in, you know, they had to, to uh, put the information on the back about what, you know, where they were going and what was going on with them. In any event, that, it was a banking job, it wasn't a lawyer's job. And I was grateful to him and have told him many times since that I was grateful to him for being willing to give me a chance. But it was not a law firm, and uh, so ultimately I didn't uh, do that. Did I, any of the women in your class get law jobs right out of law school? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, trying to think. Uh, one of them, Peggy Jones, went down to Holly Springs, Mississippi and got a job, I think, in a family firm down in that little town which is sort of southeast of Memphis. Um, Jane Ann Woods ultimately became the first woman um, commissioner uh, in the state of Tennessee, commissioner of revenue, but that wasn't immediately, of course. That was um, probably six or seven years uh, later. Rose Palermo set up a uh, law firm with her husband, Denny Cheatham, and they are still in practice uh, together. Uh, I don't know that they've ever had more than one or two other associates. And then there was me. Uh, and um, at first I worked for, um, I spent the summer after I graduated working for um, Carl Warden, hired me to do some research uh, for him on the, um, they were, doing some constitutional uh, redrafting, uh, proposed redrafting, and they were working on the uh, criminal sentences. Um, so I did, I did some of that for him. And then I actually hung out my shingle for a, a, a couple of months. I shared an office with Carlton Petway and Price Nemo. It was a one-room office. There was no secretarial help. Um, I didn't know how to type. You can tell this wasn't going to be successful, and in fact, uh, my ad valorem tax return for that year uh, indicated that I had a loss of like $54 uh, on the whole uh, venture. And we had to be very careful about scheduling clients because only one of us could be in the office <laughs> at a time. <laughs> so we kept a, a, a common uh, scheduling book, and the, and the door said, in the Stallman building said, law office, that's all. It didn't have anybody's name on it. But I was enormously grateful to those two men for letting me uh, share the office with them. In the meantime, Gil Merritt had uh, made an offer to me to join the, um, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. He had a bunch of vacancies. He had them because this was uh, the late summer, early fall of um, 1968, there was about to be a big election. 
in those days, it was not just the attorney, uh, U.S. attorney that went when the administration changed in Washington, but everybody in these smaller offices went. I doubt and Gil it Merritt was then the he appointed was then, U.S. attorney. Yeah, he was the U.S. attorney. And, and much later in both your careers, you end up on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Exactly, okay. uh, which is was you know a, a nice place to begin and end uh, one's career. Uh, anyway, the young men weren't interested in in taking on the vacancies because it wasn't clear how the um, election was going to come out. And I, <laughs> I just wanted a toe in some door, and so I was more than happy to take it. They gave me all the, the uh, civil stuff. I just, there'd never been a woman criminal prosecutor in the state of Tennessee, as far as we know. And so they, they just were nervous about I guess they thought maybe the juries wouldn't convict if a woman was prosecuting the case. And of course, those juries were all women, I mean, all men at the time. There were no women judges and there were no women on the juries. Uh, so I went in and did all the civil work except condemnation. The only other um, uh, lawyer at, at the time that Gil Merritt left the following spring after, after the Democrats lost that election, uh, there were only two of us there. Um, and the other lawyer was from Lebanon, and he was doing all the land condemnation cases. Um, and I was doing the civil stuff and the appeals. They would let me go to Cincinnati with the appeals. And then, of course, the new Republican uh, U.S. attorney came in, and uh, the new people followed in. Among them, uh, Fred Thompson. Fred and I had uh, uh, offices right next to each other for about I guess six months, um, and uh, and then of course um, I got fired uh, by the Republican who who objected not only I mean it was really it was clearly two grounds one I was a girl, and he famously said to a Tennessean reporter they may be ready for women assistant U.S. attorneys in other places in the country but not in the Middle District of Tennessee. Um, and there was this problem that I had a husband who was a political reporter for the Tennessean, which was recognized as the Democratic paper in town as opposed to the Banner, which was the Republican paper in town. And I guess he thought it was um, not smart to have somebody connected to the Tennessean in his office. I'm not sure, but in any event, there I was without a job. Before uh, we move away from that job, though, that was your first real Lawyer real job, job yes, it was. Um, did you enjoy it? What was your daily schedule like? Um, I did enjoy it, um, and I would have loved to have stayed there, uh, but it but it wasn't possible. I did go to Cincinnati two or three times at least, maybe maybe even more, with criminal appeals, which I enjoyed a lot. I liked writing the briefs, researching and writing, and and. Uh, um, the whole business of getting to Cincinnati. My parents were in a town just north of Cincinnati, so it meant I could have a visit with them as well as um, present the argument to the court. So, and where was that office located? Uh, the the one in Cincinnati, and the one here. We the were one in the federal here. building. Yeah, I was in the federal building on the eighth floor. We had offices along the back of that building, of course, long before the annex was built, and. Um, I think the uh, the uh, clerk of court is in that area now. I did go back years later, and and I could recognize my where my office was from the radiator. <laughs> so. So what happened once you were out of it? Uh, well, uh, it, it by that time I had handled a couple of criminal prosecutions and had not lost the cases. And uh, Tom Shriver, who was the state district attorney here in town, had some. Um, openings, uh, which I found out about, and and so I managed to uh, get a job there as an assistant district attorney. Um, there were some complications. There had never been a woman in, prosecuting on the sixth floor of the Metro Courthouse, um, and uh, so the first place they sent me was to General Sessions Court, to, and I was assigned to, uh, as it turned out wonderfully, Al Birch's court, and Birch had just about a few months before I got there, in fact, that's what created one of the vacancies. He had gone from being the first African-American assistant DA to becoming the first 
African-American uh, judge in Nashville and possibly in the state. I, I don't re remember well enough to know. Uh, so I had, uh, every three weeks, had court with uh, Birch, General Sessions Court with Judge Birch, and then I handled the out-of-state support cases and also the juvenile courts um, for most of a year before I moved up to criminal court, the felony uh, docket. How was that experience? Well, that was a little tougher. Uh, it wasn't done normally, but uh, General Shriver felt like he had to pave the way for me. And so we went to each of the three criminal judges to see if they would uh, permit a woman assistant to, to uh, practice in their courts. And two of them turned him down flatly. Um, and the other one, <coughs> uh, Judge Draper, agreed to take me on, but only if he could have his choice of the, the uh, I would be the second chair, obviously, and so he wanted his choice of who the first uh, assistant in assigned to his court would be. And, uh, and so he chose Arnold Peebles, who had come up from down in Columbia and was uh, a natural talent at litigation, but pretty much, and I think Arnold would admit this, a, a by the seat of his pants uh, sort of litigator. So Arnold was great with a jury, uh, and I was terrific with getting all the preparation done before it got in front of a jury, and we made a, we made a pretty good team, um, actually. And I was there for um, at least a couple of years, in addition to the year in general sessions, um, uh, about a three, three and a half year uh, stay there. Any uh, favorite cases or significant cases that you remember during that tenure? <laughs> well, uh, the, I th the scariest was, uh, was a murder case. Uh, there had not been a death penalty uh, verdict in Nashville in uh, a couple of decades, as I recall it, and we weren't seeking the death penalty, uh, but the juries did set the penalty back in those days. And so part of the instructions were uh, if you find him guilty, if you find the defendant guilty, the, uh, the applicable sentence would be somewhere between three and ten years, for example, on a burglary. And so the judge, Judge Draper, is reading out this uh, sentence for first-degree murder, which is, uh, you know, death by execution or some period of uh, time, this to that, to life. And <laughs> the jury came back... Uh, with a um, with a uh, eleven to one, they hung, and it turned out that they were trying to impose eleven of them wanted to impose the death penalty, even though we hadn't asked for it. Uh, it was kind of a stunning thing to have happen, and we were fairly glad that somebody had hung the jury up, and so we could sort of start over uh, on that one. Uh, I guess uh, the the most famous. Um, defendant that I handled, but well, there was the foot stomper, uh, which some people remember, but Hubert Putt was, was really, I guess, my favorite. Hubert Putt was a, a sort of a low-level burglar. Um, uh, he, yeah, he was an armed robber. I mean, he, he would go into the, to some of these uh, smaller places and, with a gun and, and hold him up, but he wasn't any kind of big-time bank robber. Uh, Judge Draper got very tired of seeing Hubert Putt in, in court, and um, uh, he, he, in his little voice, would say, Putt, Putt, what are you doing back in here, Putt? Um, Hubert Putt is the one that uh, laid the moniker Carrot Top on me, and um, so he, he referred to me as General Carrot Top, uh, and we went around and around um, several times. There, there are lots of good Hubert Putt stories. I wish I knew what had happened to <laughs> Hubert Pudd. We've been going for some time now, and I think it's probably a good place for us to take a break. Let's talk for a minute about your family. What's your husband's name, and how did you meet? Uh, Larry Daughtry uh, from Abilene, Texas. Uh, he uh, came to Vanderbilt on the Grantland Rice Scholarship, uh, his first time 
uh, east of the Mississippi River uh, from a family, a working class family, where he was the first to go to college and had thought that he would end up probably at the University of Texas, but, but won this nice scholarship to Vanderbilt that paid all his tuition, all his living expenses, and put him to work at America's uh, premier racetracks during the summer, so uh, in, in, in the name of Grantland Rice. Um, he was two years ahead of me at Vanderbilt. The first time I ever heard of Larry's name, I was working on the desk at McTeer Hall, the, the uh, freshman dorm, picking up a little spending money, and uh, somebody came in and said, they've discovered who the campus creeper is. Now, the campus creeper wrote the gossip column in the newspaper, and it was anonymous. And, uh, and so somehow they discovered that Larry was the person who was writing the column, and they had hustled him over to Centennial Park and thrown him in the, what is euphemistically called a lake over there. It's sort of a, a, an outsized pond that's about two feet deep, and, uh, and this was in the middle of winter. Uh, so that was the first, and I said, well, who is the campus creeper? And they said Larry Daughtry. It was the first time I'd heard his name. He uh, actually uh, dated my roommate and was pinned to my roommate. Uh, and uh, after they broke up, uh, Larry and I became friends while, while he was dating Penny. And uh, so we just kind of fell into each other's arms after they broke up and uh, ended up getting married. He, went on, he graduated and went off to... Um, the National Guard, uh, it was that or Vietnam at the time, and, uh, and, and after he finished his time in the Army, came back and we, and we married. Um, you were still an undergraduate I was, when you married. Uh, yeah, I was still, well, it was that year of the, 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 uh, the first year in law school, right. really. Um, and had Carrie uh, the next year, uh, Carrie is your daughter. What's uh, her full name? Her name is Sarah Karen Daughtry. Uh, the Karen is a family name. The Sarah is too. Um, and she was born in uh, late summer of 1964 um, and turned out to be um, the only child we had. I, I was really ready to have a second child. Uh, <laughs> Uh, several years later, but, uh, and I said to Larry, you know, who was asking about it, whatever happened to that second child we were going to have, and I said, well, you know, I'll, I'd be glad to do the first nine months. I said, but after that, we need to split up the obligations, and uh, I'll, I'll do dinners this week if you do dinners next week, and you can do the bath and the bed thing uh, this week, and I'll do it next week. We just, we'll just split it down the middle, and and he had the most appalled look on his face. And, uh, <laughs> and that was the end of the second. That's what happened to the second child. It was a gleam in his eye, and, and then it was gone. <laughs> I, I guess I wiped out the gleam in his eye. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Larry's career. Larry, uh, Larry was an English major at Vanderbilt, uh, was always headed into journalism. Uh, he had had started writing for newspapers as, uh, in, in Abilene, Texas as a, as a teenager, uh, and he was covering sports at the time, which is how he happened to be a perfect uh, uh, subject for the uh, winner of the Grantland Rice Scholarship. So after he finished school here, well, indeed, some of the time that he was uh, at Vanderbilt, instead of working for the student newspaper, except as the campus creeper, uh, he, he actually worked for the Tennessean some, and so when he'd finished uh, with the National Guard, he came back and got a full-time position with the, with the National Tennessean. So our first years of marriage, um, I was in law school. Uh, he knew something different was going on from the beginning because there weren't many women. Um, in fact, you know, when I started law school, I'd never laid eyes on a woman lawyer before, and neither had he. So it was, he knew something was, uh, something was cooking that was not the usual and was supportive of it and has been um, all through our marriage. It's been great. If Larry was not willing to do half of all the work in, in raising Carrie or any other children, what did you do about childcare? 
Well, um, I did it all. Uh, I mean, one of the things that, that happened at about that time was, um, you know, we had been told that we, we had to make a choice between a career and a family. And there was that generation of us that just gritted our teeth and said, you know, you, you're not going to tell me I can't do it all. I can do it all. Um, and uh, so uh, that's exactly uh, what happened. Uh, there, there was that famous night when Larry was sort of, you know, he'd come home from his job and read the evening paper and watch TV while I was cooking and <laughs> cleaning up and bathing Carrie and getting her to bed. And so one night about 9 o'clock, uh, I'm over there doing the dishes in the kitchen. We didn't have a working dishwasher. And he's sitting there reading a book. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it just hit me. Uh, you know, and I said, why am I washing these dishes? I mean, why didn't you wash the dishes while I was upstairs, you know, doing it all? And he looked at me and he said famously, he's never lived this down, washing dishes is sissy stuff, which apparently is what he got from being raised by his mother in Texas. Uh, uh, and so uh, I kind of went through the ceiling. <laughs> And we had a little rocky period of was that time. The closest right? you ever came to divorce? Well, <laughs> probably. Yeah, I'd say it was the closest. It just, you know, that's how most women came to the to the new women's movement. Though it was some sort of thing like that that just hit you, and uh, all of a sudden the light goes on, literally, and you you're seeing what you didn't see before. So um, that that was also about the time that that we didn't have the second child. So. Tell us a little bit about how Carrie has grown up and what she's doing now. Well, Carrie, uh, the sweet heart of my life, uh, did, in fact, uh, the, the, the story about that that I embarrassed her with recently in making a little talk for Women's uh, History Month at, at her office. She's an assistant U.S. attorney, the same office that I was in all those years ago. And they invited me to come over and speak, and I was talking about the fact that while there wasn't daycare, there were one or two little schools in town that would take nursery schools that would take them uh, not only for the morning, but feed them lunch and let them take a nap. Uh, but in order to get a child into one of those little schools, they had to be um, out of diapers. They had to be um, uh, trained. And so the, the summer that Carrie turned two uh, was the summer I wanted to go back to law school. And so I said to her, we're going to learn how to do this. <laughs> and we've got just a couple of months to do it. And because uh, and, and, I want to go to law school. And so she had a little pressure about it. You know, you're not supposed to potty train them under pressure. But I was under pressure. So she, she got under pressure and survived it nicely. I mean, she's been a wonderful success ever since. And uh, she uh, finished uh, university school here in Nashville, graduated, and went to Vanderbilt undergraduate. Uh, and then uh, she studied uh, engineering. She was in the engineering school and had a major in, triple major in computer science and and electrical engineering and mathematics and uh, was headed into technology and uh, ended up in law school, uh, happily, uh, I think, and was, the, was a John Wade Scholar at Vanderbilt Law School. And uh, her last semester, she was an intern in the district attorney's office um, doing uh, domestic violence work and just realized she had a calling to that. And uh, so instead of going with a law firm, which is where she thought she was headed to, she went to the DA's office and, is, uh, and did domestic violence work there and is now in the U.S. Attorney's Office doing child exploitation work. So, You're now a grandmother? Yes. Tell us about your granddaughters. We, uh, Carrie kept waiting for Mr. Wright to come along, and he didn't. So at about age 35, she uh, applied to adopt a child from China. And uh, we went over and, and got Maddie in 01 and went back uh, in... 07 or 08, I'm not sure which, to get her younger sister, uh, Chi Chi. So 
I now have two grandchildren, both of them born in China, different parts of China, and Carrie definitely has her hands full. Mr. Wright still isn't there, although I tell her if he does show up, we'll know he's not Mr. Maybe because he'll be signing up for more than, than uh, most men would, I think, be willing to take on. Do you think Carrie chose a career as a lawyer because she saw you as a role model? Well, I don't know. You know, she used to come over to my office when I was teaching at Vanderbilt Law School. She'd come over in the afternoon from university school, which was sort of across the street and down the block a little, and she watched the law students um, struggling, especially the women law students, and her position was, I am never, never going to law school. Um, so it, it took her a while, and what convinced her was she was uh, out in California interning at uh, Hewlett Packard in Cupertino one summer uh, and had some friends out there who were in law school. And the uh, Casey versus Planned Parenthood opinion came down from the Supreme Court, and she noticed immediately that the law students were all so interested in it and talking about it and analyzing it, and the people at work didn't even know, you know, the guys with the pocket protectors <laughs> at, at work uh, didn't know it had even happened. And um, it, it suddenly, as she called me and she said, you know, all your friends that you have that I love so much, all of them are women lawyers, and I think that's what I want to do, too. I want to go to law school. I had never encouraged or discouraged it. I, if it was going to happen, I wanted it to be her choice, and that's how it worked out. After you were at the uh, district attorney's office, mm -hmm. and you'd moved from General Sessions Court into the trial courts, what was your next job, and what caused the transition? Well, uh, you know, after several years of watching the, the uh, what went on in uh, in the courtroom, it, it occurred to me that the the job I really wanted was not as an advocate, but as the umpire, so to speak. Uh, and, but I, you know, at that point, I'd never laid eyes on a woman judge. There wasn't one in Tennessee, as far as any of us knew. Uh, it seemed like a, a sort of a pipe dream. And I went and talked to Frank Gray about it. He was a district court judge in Nashville at the time, and, a, and also a family friend. And he was also from Franklin, wasn't he? He was also from you Franklin. You have a lot of Franklin connections. <laughs> I do, <laughs> including, including me. Connie Clark. <laughs> Excuse uh, me, I digress. Go ahead. Anyway, he, I said, you know, what, what do you, what do you think? My the possibilities are, and of course he had really no idea. You got to be a judge in those days, mostly through political connections. And I said, I've got this offer to go out and teach at Vanderbilt. Maybe that would be the next thing to do. He encouraged it. Um, Vanderbilt was trying to hire, the law school was trying to hire a woman because they were under pressure from the Department of Labor. Uh, there were virtually no women on the campus anywhere at Vanderbilt at, at that time, and that's 1971, um, except in the nursing school. Uh, when I was there, I don't know what your... Um, conception was when you were on campus, but there was a woman who taught in the math department. I had her for math. There was a woman who taught in the biology department. There may have been a woman or two in the romance languages, but, but really, that was, that there was it. There weren't any more by the late 60s. No, the, uh, there, were, there were none in the English department, none in the history department. I mean, it was, it was uh, so you can understand why the interest uh, in Washington grew. So they were under pressure to hire a woman, and it was that, oh, we would hire one if we could find a qualified woman kind of thing. And even though most law schools don't hire faculty from their own graduates, uh, uh, I think it was probably Carl Warden that brought me to John Wade's attention. So John, Dean Wade agreed to let me try, uh, uh, to have a tryout, uh, and that was because Carl Warden said, well, she can co-teach criminal procedure with me and I'll keep an eye on her, in effect, and make sure that, you know, this isn't a complete uh, catastrophe. And so that's how it started out. I was a lecturer in law for a year teaching uh, criminal procedure with Carl. Uh, actually, we weren't teaching together. He would just give me certain uh, segments to teach, and, and I would go in and, and uh, handle those, uh, and he would do the others. We just kind of split it up. And it, and it was fine, uh, apparently, because they then offered to give me a full-time position the following year, um, and that's how that happened. How long did you teach at Vanderbilt? Uh, it was three and a half years. Uh, 
and they were just forming the tenure committee, uh, my tenure committee, at the time I, the opportunity to go on the Court of Criminal Appeals arose. And tell uh, us about how you came to be a member of the Court of Criminal Appeals. Well, at that point, and still is, it's a, it's a merit selection um, process. Uh, the, there's a commission that uh, uh, re recruits and, and uh, vets the people who are interested and sends names to the governor. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, I got into it, and fortunately there was, uh, were a couple of lawyers on that committee that were uh, not only, uh, uh, to whom I was a known quantity, um, Bill Willis, I guess, was my main uh, promoter on the commission, and he knew Larry. Uh, they, his law firm represented the Tennessean. And uh, Larry's mentor, of course, was uh, John Sigenthaler, and they were all pretty much friends, which is, of course, also how I probably came to Gil Merritt's attention um, early on. It's, the, the old thing about contacts is absolutely uh, true. It, it, you've got to have uh, the qualifications, but you've also got to know people uh, to get the opportunity to show that you have the qualifications. So uh, I made it onto the list. I had, al I had already, uh, I had come to the governor's attention because I was on his blue ribbon screening co uh, committee in, this is uh, Governor Blanton. After he was elected in 74, uh, he formed a blue ribbon, his blue ribbon screening committee to help him find qualified people for his cabinet. And um, there were token folks on there. I was the token woman. Uh, Washington Butler was the token African-American. Uh, Jim Neely was the token union person. I mean, we knew why we were uh, there. Uh, but, but because, so when the, the notion of putting a woman on the, on the bench, and there had never been a woman on a court of record in Tennessee, and so somebody sold Ray Blanton on the notion that he could become uh, a first himself, the first governor to appoint a woman to a court of record in Tennessee, and I don't know how they managed to sell him on that, but they did. And so he had uh, he had offered to uh, appoint me if my name came out on the list, if I made it through the process. I did. I got the appointment. So, what year was that? That was 1975. Um, How many years was it before a second woman was appointed to any six, trial court? Six, six, yeah, six years. In the meantime, there was a woman elected up in Clarksville to the uh, General Sessions Court, uh, and she ultimately became a, a, a judge on a court of general jurisdiction, Ca Carol Catalano. Um, unbeknownst to us at the time, there was a woman who was a juvenile court referee up in Upper East Tennessee who who probably can claim to have been the very first Is that law Shirley trained, Underwood? yeah, Shirley Underwood, the very first law trained woman, uh, but she was not sitting on a court of record, so that's the that's mm -hmm. the difference. Do you have a story about getting fitted for a robe? <laughs> yes, uh, the robes in those days came from uh, a menswear store called Joseph Frank and Son, and oh, Mr. Frank was old. I mean, he really was old, and I wandered down there. Um, I was working on a project uh, with the Supreme Court at the time. Um, I was on a commission that was developing the uh, rules of criminal procedure, and I took a break from that um, and went down the hill to Mr. Frank's emporium, and uh, since it was at noon, his seamstress was not there, and so he had to, uh, take all the measurements for the for the robe and he was stunned i mean the first question was i don't know what you call a lady judge do you, should i call you judge s and i knew at that point that it was going to be a little rough uh, in one way or another uh, so then the next question was, how long did I want the robe? And I said, I, I don't understand what you mean. How far off the floor, he said. And I said, well, how far off the floor do the men have their robes? Eight inches, he said. I said, eight inches. That's just, you know, that'll, that'll be fine. And we figured in, you know, an inch or two for the heels that everybody wore back in those days. And so then he started taking the measurements, and he 
took the arm length and he took the length across my back and then it became time to take the chest measurement and I could see he was getting increasingly nervous about the whole thing. Eventually he got the, the uh, tape around the middle and it sort of fell off one side <laughs> and he was I could tell he was not going to pick it back up so I was a little nervous about the robe coming fortunately it's gathered in that area so it was going to fit anyway but I had no idea whether he he'd uh, gotten it right or not then he wanted to know finally was did I want buttons or a zipper and I didn't know so I got to a telephone and called Joe Henry, who was on the commission with me and on the, on the Supreme Court at the time. I said, Joe, what do I want on this robe? Do I want buttons or a zipper? And Joe said, when you're at home at night and you're wearing a robe for comfort, what do you like the best? And I said, a zipper. And he said, well, that's what you want. And so to this day, those silk robes that uh, old Mr. Frank measured me for I still have two of the three of them. One of them disappeared over in Jackson. Uh, keep an eye out for it. That's only been 20 years ago, or 17. Um, and the one in Cincinnati is in tatters. I mean, it's 35 years old, and it's, it's got lots of air conditioning <laughs> in it, and I simply refuse to have it replaced for sentimental reasons. Your office was in the Tennessee Supreme Court building, was. where we're sitting now. Uh, most people think of appellate judges as being isolated. What, what was the day-to-day -day routine like? Well, it, it was uh, sort of isolating. Uh, it, it was a secretary at the time and a law clerk, and that's who you saw mostly on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the, the person on the court that I was the closest to was uh, Bill Russell, who lived in Shelbyville. And Bill came up here um, and had an office in the building and came up regularly, but it, it would have been, the job would have been even more pleasant if he'd been here every day. He was the one that really helped me make the transition from uh, the law school uh, onto the bench. And he was uh, probably the most generous and uh, really affectionate uh, mentor that I had all the way along. He was simply wonderful. I miss him very much. Did your other colleagues accept you? <laughs> Not entirely. Um, they, you know, I hadn't laid eyes on ever on a woman judge, and neither had they, and it was just a little rocky uh, to begin with. But, you know, it all sort of worked out in the end, I have to say. Um, it, it was good to have Bill Russell, though, to sort of uh, keep, keep the, uh, the uh, waves from crashing over me. Um, a couple of times. Was there any training for new judges then? None, uh, but there were the um, the uh, seminars, uh, the the uh, twice a year educational uh, seminars that were run. Um, the first one I went to at down at Henry Horton Park. I think it made Bill Russell very nervous. He didn't want me to stay at the park. Uh, and took me home with him to stay with uh, him and his wife, now Lacey. Uh, I, I think he was a little afraid of, uh, you know, what might be said <laughs> to me if I was left down there without a chaperone. And uh, so for, for several of those uh, meetings, I stayed with them in, um, out in the country where they lived. There outside. are some stories about uh, judicial conference. Do you want to tell any of them? Well, they used to be. Uh, I, you'd have to. You'd have to say. I think uh, whether they have become more staid in the years since then. Uh, about 35 years ago, the the judges uh, got away from home, and there was a little carousing that uh, went on at the state parks, even though alcohol was normally not allowed. And there, there, there was at least one occasion where I got to my room, turned off the light, and pretended I wasn't there and ignored people beating on the door saying, come out, come out. You, you know, you're not having any fun in there by yourself. Come on out here and let us buy you a drink kind of thing. Um, but um, I, I, things changed over the years. People got much more professional, and I'm sure it's totally professional these days. Do you remember the first case that you ever sat on or the first opinion you ever wrote on the Court of Criminal Appeals? I, I don't think I remember the very first one, but 
uh, early on in the in my uh, tenure, uh, I did get a case from Memphis uh, in which the the trial judge had denied probation to uh, in a in a two bit burglary case where somebody passing through hungry and cold had had broken into a, an unoccupied dwelling uh, just so that he could uh, spend the night. And uh, the, the sort of hard-nosed judge down there in, in Memphis had denied probation in the case. Nobody had ever been reversed for denying probation in a case, and I uh, sitting with Bill Russell and another one of my colleagues, I'm not sure I remember who it was now, did reverse that and send it back so that the so that this out-of-state person could be put on probation, didn't have to go to the penitentiary. Uh, apparently that was one of the reasons that Bill Russell was convinced that I shouldn't uh, be left alone <laughs> at the state park a month or two after that. I think it was a, a, a topic of a lot of discussion among the uh, among the trial judges that not just that they had gotten reversed, but they'd gotten reversed by this, you know, sassy woman who was only 33 years old and uh, uppity girl uh, kind of person. So, um, what other? cases uh, on the CCA, do you consider your most interesting or, or most important cases? Well, there was also one at about that time um, that involved actually a district attorney uh, that down south of here who was actually a, an acquaintance of mine and a friend of my husband's who the uh, state versus judge, and he had, uh, in arguing to a jury about the defendant in closing arguments, had said, you know, and furthermore, you've heard all this, and then there are things about this guy I wish I could tell you, but the rules of evidence won't let me tell you these things, and and the jury convicted, and it came up, and, um, and I wrote an opinion that is still cited, um, uh, and not only in Tennessee, but um, I noticed got cited in some Sixth Circuit cases uh, recently saying uh, that you can't do that. You can't uh, uh, rely on uh, something that you know and argue that to the jury, that it's uh, denial of due process to the, to the defendants. That sort of didn't make me very popular either with the district attorneys around the state. So um, I was, you know, n never afraid of sticking my neck out a little. And uh, so that was that was interesting. Uh, the the uh, I did I was one of a number of people who tried to get the two intermediate courts consolidated. Uh, one of the problems was that we that the criminal cases tended to get run of the mill after a while. And the other problem was that most of the people that went up to the Tennessee Supreme Court came from the Court of Appeals with absolutely no background in criminal law at all. So that there was one year, I recall, uh, that the Supreme Court, uh, as part of its discretionary appellate jurisdiction, took only six um, criminal cases in the entire year, which was definitely not enough. And. Uh, so um, we, were, we worked at trying to get the two cases, some, a few of us trying to get the two courts consolidated, and it was a pushback from the civil judges that, that kept that from happening, and it, to this day, it still hasn't happened. Um, and it was uh, uh, until the late 80s before anybody from the Court of Criminal Appeals did become a member of the Supreme Court, and then several of us after that with criminal law experience got on the court. Um, made you, a difference. One general question. Do you enjoy the intellectual process of, of writing and analyzing appellate Oh, opinions? yes. I mean, that's, if you don't, you don't have any business being an appellate judge. Um, I, I n never have handled a trial. I'm sure I would probably enjoy it. It has its own excitement, but uh, it, it is the sort of academic work that the appellate courts do that that really has been uh, my home. Martha Craig Daughtry was the first woman to become a member of the Tennessee Supreme Court. How did that happen? Well, it happened uh, 
because uh, I, I, that is a story I'll have to tell and tell quickly. I, I hadn't really thought about it. it. All the judges in Tennessee, as people watching this probably know, take office on the same day in September every eight years. There's, there is no staggering unless, unless somebody steps out of office uh, during the eight-year term. And uh, so the Supreme Court was going to be up for re-election in 1990. And I was up in the summer of 89 in New York teaching, as I had for years, at the Appellate Judges Seminar at NYU. And Margaret Bam called me. And, uh, and uh, I had to find a payphone out on the street. This is before cell phones, to call her back. And she said, in effect, to make a long story short, we want a woman on the Supreme Court. It's 1990s coming up. We think it's... Uh, past time, and uh, we're, we're giving you first refusal on, uh, on uh, running for the Supreme Court. Um, and, and I took it. Uh, most people have been able over the years to get me to do a lot of things that <laughs> probably were crazy by saying, we need a woman, we've never had a woman do this, and we need a woman, and I fall for it every time. But uh, the truth is, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure if I hadn't done it, uh, the next person in line would have been Connie Clark. Uh, and Connie, you were on the um, uh, Democratic, Democratic executive. State Executive yeah. Committee at the time, which was the group that, um, that actually did the nominating. And uh, so the, the problem was that there was an incumbent in office, a, a, a respected incumbent, a very uh, conservative sort of judge, but um, somebody that, that a lot of the sort of older lawyers in town held in great esteem. And in order to get on the court, one of us was gonna have to run against him. And um, I guess Margaret convinced me to, to do it. Um, and it was- This was not precisely a merit selection no, process. No, it was not a merit what selection. What was the selection it, process for well, this Well, uh, it, was, it was partisan. In, in addition to the fact that it was an open election, it was a partisan election. So. It first had to get the Democratic nomination and uh, then uh, run against any Republicans that might uh, be put up. Uh, and so the, the job was uh, that I had in front of me, having agreed to do it, was six months of canvassing the Democratic State Executive Committee members, 66 of them across the, street, uh, across the state, uh, 33 women, 33 men, uh, from Memphis to almost to Mountain City, not quite to Mountain City. And I spent six months uh, going uh, from door to door, <laughs> in, in, in a sense, and talking to each uh, member of the, of the committee. It was a fabulous experience in terms of getting around Tennessee, not just meeting these people, not all of whom by any uh, means that, that I knew, but also get, going places that I never would have gone uh, otherwise, because the point was to get to them in their home uh, areas. Lots of wonderful stories about it. Uh, but in the end, it worked out uh, that I had something like, um, I think, 50 votes among the 66, and uh, there were like six or eight people that didn't show up in the long run. So it was a, it was a big victory. And To a close the circle, one. I didn't get to vote for you. Do you remember why that was? No. Because... I was appointed circuit judge that's right. before you on the bench. Uh, we actually you went got on the to bench. the bench. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's exactly true. But you were supporting me, which I valued very much. And and so when you, when it became your turn to go on the Supreme Court, I was the happiest person in the state about it. I'm happier than anybody else you know, because I always felt like I had gotten your seat on the Supreme Court in the first place. And uh, so I was very very pleased about it. Well, that's not true, but you have uh, always been completely supportive of women who were seeking judgeships and, and other leadership positions. Has that been important to you? Oh, totally important. Um, the, uh, one of the things we did was, um, I remember talking to a woman who was the founder of the National Association of Women Judges and finding out from her that there were like, this was back in about 19... 79 or 80 that there were 125 women judges in California, which just knocked me out since I was at that point still the only one in Tennessee. 
And I said, how did you do that? And she said, well, Jerry Brown, the governor, appointed most of them. And I said, because he just thinks there ought to be all these women judges? Or, and she said, no, it was because the women's bar associations uh, went to the governor and lobbied. And, and I'm saying to myself, women's bar associations, now there's a good idea. <laughs> and so subsequently, almost immediately, we formed the, the uh, Lawyers Association for Women in Nashville and later the Tennessee wide um, uh, group and uh, actually used uh, materials and people that the National Association uh, of Women Judges sent to Tennessee for us to use to uh, put on uh, so you want to be a judge uh, seminars, training seminars for people that wanted to do that. It's always been important. You became a member of the Supreme Court in 1990. What were the most important issues, uh, administrative or legal, before the court then? Well, How did your court react yeah, to Yeah, there were just, we, we did have a new, new majority on the court. Um, three of us came on new on a court of five. Um, I had campaigned on uh, a couple of issues. One was the um, establishment of an authentic uh, uh, administrative office of the courts. and. Uh, um, and I'm proud to say that ultimately you became the, the head of that, um, of that office. The first woman. To the do, first yeah. woman to do that. Uh, I mean, there had been this little staff of uh, somebody called the executive secretary to the Supreme Court before that. And when I started uh, on, the, on the bench, there were two people, the executive secretary and, uh, and an assistant. And that just isn't the way it was being run in most places around the country, which I knew from all the work I did with the ABA. So I was firmly behind that. And then the other thing was ADR, which we had very little of in Tennessee. Um, one of my colleagues that was running with me at the time asked me at some point, he said, I just talked to so-and-so down in wherever, and they said you'd come through two days ago and you were talking about ADR. And he and looked at me. And what does ADR stand uh, for? Alternative Dispute Resolution. And so he turned to me and said, what is this ADR? <laughs> so that's sort of where we were with Alternative Dispute Resolution in, in 1989, 1992. And so those were the two administrative things that I ran on. And while I was on the court, we got mandatory uh, uh, at, at continuing education and the, that commission set up. Uh, we got the rules uh, revamped, the rules of procedure revamped, uh, the rules of evidence uh, established. There was a lot that went on uh, during that uh, period. How old were you when you took office? Uh, well, let's see, I was 33 when I went on the Court of Criminal Appeals and um, so 15 years later I was 48 when I went on the Supreme Court. How long were you on the Tennessee Supreme Court? Three and a half years. I was not looking for another job. I think in many respects it was the best job I ever had. Uh, I, I was crazy about most of my colleagues, uh, liked the work a lot. Uh, what case that you wrote is the most important? Oh, well, the frozen embryo cases, <laughs> undoubtedly. Uh, is that Davis versus Davis? Davis versus Davis. It was the, it was the quintessential case of first impression because there was nothing anywhere. Uh, there were people th involved in in vitro fertilization um, in various parts of the world at that point, Australia, Europe, here in the United States, uh, but there was no uh, uh, legal precedent of any kind when the case came to us. Uh, and it was, um, a, in effect, a custody case. They, they had had these, uh, the, this couple had had the uh, embryos stored while they were still together and then divorced um, or separated uh, before she ever became pregnant. And there were these embryos left over and the question was what to do with them and they couldn't agree. She wanted initially to keep them so she could be implanted with them, and then she got remarried in the midst of all the litigation, and her new husband wasn't interested in having her ex-husband's embryos uh, uh, implanted, and so then she wanted to donate them to a childless couple, and the, the father, the would-be father, the male progenitor, 
had, had been raised in an orphanage and simply didn't want children that were his um, procreation uh, out there in the world somewhere where he didn't know about them. And it was, it was a, you know, sincere uh, objection to, to what she wanted to do. And as a result, they ended up in uh, litigation. And it came up to us. Um, and what did you decide? Well, we decided that um, that the uh, well, it, it, as, as Rush Limbaugh noted later, the father won. Rush thought I was a hero because the 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 male actually won the case. Uh, <laughs> I think he may have recanted it somewhere, someplace along the line. Uh, the, the the interesting and and it was based on the establishment of the right to privacy in the Tennessee Constitution. That's what the case actually stands for. That there is a there is a right to privacy that uh, that the f that the male progenitor had the right to invoke uh, uh, the the ability to control his own uh, genetic material uh, and the ability to say that he didn't want those embryos implanted uh, in, in, into somebody who was not his own wife. Um, the interesting story behind that is it got a lot of national attention, and we did have uh, the press out front when the when the case was argued over in Knoxville. Uh, and Lyle Reed, who was the chief justice at the time, and was uh, making the assignments of who would write what what case would write the opinion that in the cases that we heard. And we took a morning break. We took a mid morning break after we heard the arguments in that case. And he said, you know, I really don't know. Uh, how to assign this case. So I'm going to ask that any of you that are interested in writing it pass me a note at lunch and I'll decide then uh, this afternoon who, to whom the case should be assigned. And, and those wimpy men, uh, I was the only one that said, I want to do it, I do, I really want to do this. And so I got it by default. Uh, but it is what I call a tombstone case where they where they put on your tombstone if you have one she wrote the frozen embryos <laughs> decision um, so what difference did it make to have a woman in deliberations about that kind of case and all your cases oh well it you know I tell the story about when I left the Supreme Court uh, the a friend of, of ours who was the uh, editorial managing editor over at the Knoxville newspapers called me and said, okay, so you're leaving the court, the first woman's leaving the court, what is your legacy? And I was struck by this and I said, you know what, I'm, Tom, I'm going to have to call you back. I'm going to have to think about this and call you back. So I go out to Pat Norman, my secretary, and I said, we've got to come up with a legacy here. <laughs> they want to know what my legacy is. And uh, actually, uh, thinking about it for a little while, I called him back and I said, I think it's, uh, surprisingly enough, the domestic relations cases because it was an area of the law that had simply been, uh, well, the criminal law had been too, but that part of the development of the law in Tennessee had just simply been ignored for years. It wasn't important to the men. And in a couple of cases uh, where they did take uh, th those issues up, they decided them the wrong way. So that was terribly important. The other thing that was going on while I was on the court was uh, I implementation of the state constitution. Uh, the, uh, the judges who were on the court before us, with one exception really, and that being Joe Henry, uh, were not interested in, in the movement that was g going on across the country at the time to uh, look at the state constitution and, as well as the federal constitution in deciding cases. So we made a lot of, hit a lot of precedents, and particularly in criminal law um, at the time. Does, did it make any difference that your court sits in three different grander visions? Well, uh, you know, that was decided in 1835 or something when they put it in the Constitution then that the judges would travel instead of the lawyers. Um, I, no, but I, I, I do Is think... Is there a difference in the kinds of cases or in the lawyering that you uh, see? No, not really. Um, it, 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 but it probably was good that we got out and, and uh, saw some other parts of the state. I think the, the current court uh, and the court 
after I left, carried that out even further uh, with, with different kinds of projects around the state. We, we even set up a, a swearing in in various parts of the state instead of making all the new lawyers come to Nashville. Uh, the Jackson, as the, as the place where the Supreme Court met, uh, was set up in, in, in that 1835 um, Constitution at, because at the time Memphis was just a little river town of absolutely no consequence at all. And Jackson was a big commercial uh, area for cotton and other kinds of uh, agricultural uh, products. And so the people in Memphis felt very sort of ignored because the court went as far as Jackson and no further west. And uh, so on several occasions, we went to Memphis and actually sat in Memphis, which, which, uh, the, which the bar, the Memphis bar, appreciated, I think, very much. You did not live in the same city with all your colleagues. There was not a requirement that everybody right. live in Nashville during your tenure on the Supreme Court. Did that make any difference in how you communicated with one another? Well, in those days, um, yes. We didn't have as much face-to-face uh, -face communication as some of us would have liked because it meant that people had to come in from out of town. Um, as I understand it now, the court's using video conferencing to a great degree. Um, and that's good because you get face-to-face -face discussion uh, fairly frequently. I don't think probably you get as good a feel for your uh, colleagues as you did when you could uh, argue with them around a table all morning and then go to lunch together um, afterwards or have a drink in the evening uh, together. Uh, so I think probably that's missing. On the other hand, I think the court's probably having uh, intercourt uh, communications more frequently than we were able to do before. After three and a half years of an eight-year term on the Supreme Court, you were not looking for another job. Uh, what yes, happened? and my husband at that time was covering the um, Clinton-Gore campaign. Um, and at some point along about October before the November election, um, in, in 94, um, uh, excuse me, 92, right? I'm, I'm, yes, Yeah, 92. I'm getting myself confused. Uh, Al Gore said something to Larry about, um, what about Sissy uh, on the Sixth Circuit? And, and Larry said, well, gee, I, we've never discussed that. I don't think she's looking for a new job. And, and, uh, and Gore said, well, maybe she ought to think about it uh, some. And uh, I was sort of surprised when Larry came home and repeated the conversation. But in fact, the more we thought about it, um, the more it seemed like it might be uh, a good possibility. I really, uh, I th I really think the work with the Supreme Court was, was tops. I'm, I'm, and I've said it even to my colleagues on the Sixth Circuit. It was the greatest, it was the best job I had. On the other hand, uh, trying to run again for office, um, especially in the wake of the, the Penny White uh, debacle. Um, I hope you all have talked to Penny White. Uh, uh, it had been a wonderful experience the first time I did it, but it had, it had produced a lot of uh, stress-related health issues for me, and uh, it, just, it just seemed like a, a, a challenge I didn't need to go through twice. And here was this nice um, lifetime tenure job <laughs> calling to me, a little raise in pay, not a lot, but some, and sort of a new challenge at a point where I had been on the bench uh, for 18 years and doing the same really sort of work and this looked like something new and, and different um, and I so I took a shot at it. Because you accepted that challenge a very short time into your Tennessee Supreme Court tenure, uh, you w did not ever become, you really hadn't been eligible at that point to become Chief, Chief. Justice. Right. Is that a regret? Not at all. Um, the the uh, chief justice that we had while well, the whole time I was on the court, Lyle Reed, I thought did a wonderful job. There is the funny story, which I've told publicly, so I'm not telling secrets, at least not for the first time. 
when we all got elected in 1990, the question was who would become the chief justice because he's chosen, he or she, is chosen by uh, the members of the court and, and not elected as such or appointed by the governor or other ways that it's done in other states. And um, the um, interesting thing was that each of the men voted for himself and that meant I got to pick the chief justice. And uh, so, you know, it's a feeling of uh, power and accomplishment when you cast a vote and, and there it is. So it fell to me to choose and I thought Lyle Reed did a beautiful job and I'm sure others did a good job after he uh, was finished with his term, but that was, that was how he became chief judge, chief justice. You came to the Supreme Court in 1990, it's 2010, 20 years later. Today the court has a female Chief Justice and a majority of members who are women and, and this Chief Justice will be succeeded by a second female Chief Justice this September. How does that make you feel? Well, uh, it's so fabulous that, uh, I mean, when, it, when, the, when, the, uh, when Janice Holder became Chief Justice and indeed when Sharon Lee became a member of the court, I mean, it, it was beyond anything I ever could have imagined. Uh, now, some really astounding things have happened over my career. Uh, if you had, if anybody had told me when I was uh, uh, in law school that I was going to become, uh, that I'd someday sit in the chair that Harry Phillips was sitting in at a point where Harry Phillips wouldn't even hire a woman clerk, uh, I would have been flabbergasted, but even uh, in 1990, if you had told me that there was going to be a majority of women on the court uh, or a woman chief justice or two in a row, I would have said, you've got to be dreaming somehow. The, the first court, Supreme Court, that had a majority of women on it was the Minnesota Supreme Court. I'm, I'm not sure what year that was. But we were all so uh, encouraged about it and, and really happy about it that there was this threat that we would, uh, the women uh, lawyers of uh, Nashville would rent a bus and drive to St. Paul and just sit in the back of the courtroom there and, and watch this happen in front of our very eyes, a court that reflected, you know, the world as it really was, and then file out, get back on the bus and drive back to Nashville just so we could see this happen. And now here it is happening in our own state. It's fabulous. When you went to the Sixth Circuit, you encountered a first of a different sort in terms of, of women colleagues. What was that? Well, I had some. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, the first time you weren't the first. It was something. the first job that I had ever held where I was not the first and only woman uh, there and it was really grand. Uh, Cornelia Kennedy had uh, joined the court in about 78 or 79 and uh, Alice Batchelder, who's now the chief judge, had come on a year or two maybe before I got there. So I had uh, two colleagues on the court and then um, Karen Moore uh, was the next appointment after mine and so there were four of us on a court of 16 which is uh, which is a uh, you know almost like the real world. Tell us about your uh, early or most important cases on the Sixth Circuit. Uh, you know, I, uh, there's not a case that I've handled on the Sixth Circuit that sort of uh, has the frozen embryo. Um, uh, prominence to it. Uh, but there are some cases. Um, there, there's been at least one Title VII um, case that turned out to be important, the Williams case, uh, that had to do with uh, sexual harassment on the job. That, that was important. There was a dissent in, a, in the uh, case involving the criminal charges, federal criminal charges against David Lanier, a uh, chancellor down in Dyersburg, Tennessee, uh, that turned out to have some uh, was one of those dissents where the Supreme Court says, hey, you're right, the dissenter is right, and it kind of makes you proud of, of the work you've done. Uh, the, but the, um, and there have been some election cases that have uh, been important, but I don't know that there's a single case that I can point to that just, that I think is a tombstone case, to, to use my own. And how does the day-to-day -day work 
differ from your work on the Supreme Court? Um, well, it is back to being an intermediate court uh, again. Instead of picking and choosing the cases as the Supreme Court does and taking the cases for some really important reason, uh, not just to correct errors that might have happened at, at trial, but because you're trying to develop the law, there, here I am now back on an intermediate court where you take what you get. I mean, it comes flying at you. There's lots of it. Uh, you're, you're working on the case that's in front of you, doing the best job you can, getting it off your desk because there are, you know, 16 more that are coming in. And, uh, and most of it is um, dealing with legislation uh, from Congress. So it's statutory interpretation for the most part. Uh, I think the, the thing that I've said that struck me the most about going to federal court was the cases seem to come in bunches. Um, so that when I first got there, I got hit with this run of ERISA cases. And I have to tell you, uh, I didn't know anything about ERISA. And I could have spent the rest of my life not knowing anything about ERISA and been just as happy. Uh, so I get this run of ERISA cases that are just sort of um, a mystery, uh, really. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what have I done? I gave up this good job on the Tennessee Supreme Court dealing with all kinds of law development and important constitutional cases. And here I am, you know, with ERISA. Um, and, uh, but then the next bunch of cases that came in were, were a good run of First Amendment cases. And so I said to myself, aha, well, this is sort of what I was hoping for and what I expected. So it's a, it's a much broader, in a sense, it's a much broader uh, range of cases uh, simply because the legislation coming out of Washington is so broad. And every once in a while we run into a new statute that we just simply have not seen before. Um, but that's the kind of sort of uh, work it is. Uh, none of the common law development, none of the tort law, none of the domestic relations law. Uh, most of the criminal law is sentencing issues now, um, really. So it's it's just a it's apples and oranges compared to the Supreme Court of Tennessee. Federal Circuit judges are nominated by the president, but they must be confirmed mm -hmm. by the Senate. Uh, today we see some hearings that are uh, pretty contentious. Um, your your confirmation process was not without uh, interesting events. It, it was. Um, uh, it, Patsy Cottrell, who's now on the Court of Appeals, was the head deputy over at the uh, Attorney General's office, called me one day as the, as the confirmation process was going along in Washington and said, uh, you know, this group called Free Congress, somebody from this group just called me and, and wanted to know if, the, if we would join them, if our office would join them in opposing your uh, confirmation. And, and I, she said, I was struck dumb and said, well, of course we're not going to do that. Why would we want to do that? And apparently it had to do with the death penalty cases that the Tennessee Supreme Court was deciding at the time. And that was, in fact, uh, what the opposition centered on was, was the positions that I had taken on death penalty cases. At that point, however, I hadn't ever written an opinion, I had simply joined them. And many of the ones where the death penalty, I think there, by the time I was confirmed, there were, we had decided something like 13 death penalty cases. And um, most of those where the, where the sentence of death had been reversed were unanimous opinions where all five judges had joined in. So um, it, was, it was not me on some kind of uh, personal uh, uh, crusade against the death penalty, uh, but that's the way it was uh, interpreted in Washington. How long have you served on the Sixth Circuit? What's your status today? Uh, I am, I have taken senior status. I did that about uh, a little over a year ago. Um, and uh, so uh, this is my, I guess my 17th year uh, on the court. Um, and uh, I became eligible for senior status if, after 16 years. My caseload has gone down some. The number of clerks that I have has gone down some, but the days still seem to fill up with work. I'm a little amazed that, it, that I haven't really felt the, felt the uh, supposed uh, ease in, in the amount of work yet. 
Your colleagues on the Sixth Circuit come from four states, and most people maintain primary offices in, in their hometowns. Right. You sit in Cincinnati. What kind of relationship uh, do you have and have you had with colleagues over the years who are much farther removed geographically and, and well, philosophically? Well, it's true. I mean, Detroit is a long way uh, culturally uh, from, say, Memphis, Tennessee or Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, but it, in, a, in a sense, that's what makes the, the work interesting is that you've, you've, you're dealing with, as colleagues, uh, different folks from different uh, legal cultures and backgrounds. And uh, to the extent that we're applying state law in cases, it's not ten just Tennessee law anymore, and which makes it certainly more interesting. There have been difficulties on the Sixth Circuit uh, in the past few years that have um, uh, been largely attributed to the political background of the of the uh, presidential appointment, and and it has been unfortunate uh, in many respects that that exists. But but the Sixth Circuit's not the only court where that where the division along political lines has has occurred. I must say, th none of that ever happened in the state court that I'm aware of. Um, we had uh, on the Court of Criminal Appeal judges from uh, that were dyed in the wool Democrats from you know, West Tennessee and dyed in the wool Republicans from East Tennessee, and it just sort of never made any difference in the outcome of the cases, either on that court or the uh, Supreme Court. But it, but on the federal circuit courts, it can, it can, um, it can happen. You've always had a special interest in judicial education, and you're, you have a long-time relationship. Uh, with New York University and, and the uh, school they have there for appellate judges in particular. Tell us about that. Well, I went up there uh, in 19, the summer of 1976 as a student at the appellate judges seminar. Um, at the, the law professor who ran that program had been a visiting professor at Vanderbilt um, while I was on the faculty there, and so I was a, sort of a known quantity when I got there. Uh, that, by the way, that group of about 18 or 20 uh, appellate judges from around the country included the first woman judge that I ever laid eyes on, uh, Sonia Morgan from the Court of Appeals in New Jersey. And, and I was asked back to uh, join the faculty the next summer in 1977, and except for a few years in the early, a couple of years in the early 1990s, I've been on the faculty up there ever since. And it's been a real joy, because I've met uh, judges from all over the country and uh, served on the faculty uh, for long uh, periods of time with the same uh, really great judges from around the country. It's just been, it's been a joy. What's the most important quality for a good judge to have? Um, m my first pick would be open-mindedness. Um, uh, others might say temperament or intellectual ability. Um, uh, to me, the, the, the whole thing is about being open-minded as you approach the cases and open to the lawyer's arguments and uh, not given to deciding uh, an issue before you see it in the context of a case. I, I think that would be my, my first strike. As my next to last question, what things would you like to talk about that I may not have asked about? You know, I think you've covered it all. It may be because we know each other <laughs> as well as we do, uh, but I, I I'm going to get out of here in a few minutes and think of about six different things I wish I had said, but right now I'm sort of speechless. Martha Craig, Sissy Daughtry, you are a um, role model to many people. And there are many people who thank you for the careers that they've had. What would you say, though, is the single professional thing, not your family, but the single thing that you would most likely like to be remembered for? Um, well, um, I, I think it is uh, having having been the first woman in so many places. The one thing that I was absolutely committed to was getting the next woman in. So I appreciate what you 
just said, because it was very important to me that I, that I not be the queen bee, uh, the one and only. Uh, it was so important to me that others come in behind me. And I'm proud to say that in almost every case, I've had something to do with uh, the next woman in and the woman after that. It is, I mean, for instance, the, the Lawyers Association for Women here in Nashville, uh, what, a, what, a, what a wonderful thing to have been involved in establishing. I just saw the, the most recent newsletter, and I have to tell you that except for Martha Trammell, who was in, uh, at Vanderbilt when I was there, I didn't recognize any of the possibly 15 young women who are moving into the officers' positions and the boards of directors, uh, the board of directors, first and second year, I don't know those young women. And in a way that's sad, uh, in a way that's, but, but it is what we wanted back all those years ago, and it was very slow in coming. Uh, it was much slower in happening than I would have thought possible. But when it happened, it really, it really has, uh, it really has changed. And there are women everywhere in the profession now. Uh, there is, there are still some mountains to climb. Uh, it, the uh, numbers of women uh, in the very highest positions in the law firms uh, looks to me like, especially in Tennessee, they haven't been as successful as we've been on the bench, actually. Um, so there's, there's still places that 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 uh, that need some polishing. Um, but for the most part, that's been really important to me. And um, I hope I can be remembered for that. And I know you will. Thank you. Mm -hmm.